But first up now, joining us live out of Canberra, we have the US Ambassador to Australia, Mr Geoffrey Bleich. Mr Ambassador, thanks very much for your company. Well, thanks for having me on, Peter, and nice to see you again, Paul. Let me ask you straight up, uh, Barack Obama has been re-elected. Uh, you're well known to be very close to the president. Uh, what does this mean, uh, chiefly for Australia-US relations going forward over the next four years? Well, uh, I think one thing it means is that I don't have to start packing immediately. And so I'm looking forward to being able to stay here for a while. And I know my family feels the same way. Uh, but in terms of the overall architecture of the U.S.-Australia relationship, I think one of the great things is that uh, it doesn't really matter who's elected, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican in the White House or whether it's a Labor or Liberal National Coalition leader in the uh, parliament. We always seem to make progress together. Uh, and, and that has been because we're not basing our relationship on partisan issues. We're basing it upon uh, enduring values relating to, you know, how we view the world. And those are, you know, focused on things like open markets, free trade, uh, freedom of, exp of expression, uh, democracy. Those sorts of elements are things that bind us together and, and uh, that, that those aren't going to change between political parties. Were you surprised in the end by the size of the victory? I realised that it was close in a number of states, but ultimately that added up to a pretty sizable win on the Electoral College votes for the president. Did that surprise you? Well, we always knew it was going to be a very closely run race, but in general, races tend to break one way or another as you get closer and closer to the, uh, the, the final days of voting. Uh, the reason undecided voters are uh, surprised is because they really stay undecided until uh, just as they're about to enter into the uh, the ballot box and, and that's why there's that intense um, um, politicking and campaigning at the very end of an election cycle so uh, I, I can't say that I was stunned that it broke one way because we've seen this happen in the past. Amb Ambassador we've got a very important meeting uh, coming up uh, uh, in Perth the uh, Osmin meeting uh, I'd like to refer you to the comments made by the senior American official, Kurt Campbell, indicating that the administration, the Obama administration, has worries about the cuts to the Australian defence budget. How concerned is the administration about those cuts? Well, uh, you know, I know, I know Kurt Campbell well, and, and uh, I know that uh, he doesn't have worries about the budget. I, I think the statements that he made or uh, you may be referring to um, may have been misinterpreted. What he said was that uh, when we get together, we always talk about budgets, we always talk about defense uh, budgets because they help us determine what our priorities are. And this is an annual meeting that we have every year uh, where we get together, bring our Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense together with the Defense Minister and the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and we talk about what our uh, opportunities are and what our priorities are and so uh, obviously budgets are going to be part of that and he said that was important but I, I, I know more so than in, in any, any other year. But the Australian defence budget has been very significantly cut uh, so let me ask you uh, directly uh, surely yeah. uh, the United States has some uh, concerns or worries about that? No I, you know we actually don't we we do trust one another. I think there have been periods where the U.S. Uh, has had to make adjustments in its own defense spending, and I think our allies always uh, have shown confidence in us that no matter what our budget demands are, we're always going to meet our obligations to our allies and also uh, maintain the security needs of the United States. And we've seen that in Australia. Year after year, they've done the same thing. So we understand that there are going to be these uh, adjustments and in, in budgets year to year but in terms of the commitments we hear the same thing from Australia that we've always heard they will meet their uh, commitment to us as allies and they'll also uh, committed to ensuring the security of, uh, of Australia. Mr Ambassador can I ask you there were reports over the weekend in relation to the coalition considering the use of nuclear submarines by the Australian Navy is that something that the US uh, would provide you know I guess what you might call nuclear support of were that to be a policy road that the coalition took Australia after the next election? You know this is one of those topics that keeps coming up and uh, as far as I can tell it's I mean it's it, it's an idea to speculate about but it is so far away from ever being a um, uh, a serious policy consideration for a variety of reasons. First, uh, politically, there's, there hasn't been a, uh, uh, a, a real momentum for 
development of a nuclear energy program at all, let alone uh, nuclear submarines uh, in, uh, in Australia. And unless you've got that kind of infrastructure, unless you've got people who are trained and really understand uh, nuclear energy, it's very, very difficult to, um, to, to maintain any sort of other nuclear industries. So I think that's probably you know, where, the, where the conversation would have to begin, and that's an issue for Australia, not for the United States. To the extent that uh, Australia were ever interested in developing nuclear capabilities uh, for its energy industry or other things, then, then we could start having that conversation at that point. It's also been reported, Ambassador, uh, in the context of the uh, decision by the two governments to rotate those 2,500 uh, US Marines through the Northern Territory, that the Australian government, on the eve of the visit by President Obama, started to get cold feet about that and wanted to rethink and reassess uh, the policy. Um, to what extent was the United States concerned about those last-minute doubts held by the Australian government? Yeah, well, in, in the first place, we, we generally don't get into the business of talking about what internal discussions were. But let me say, we never had any doubt that this was going to move forward. So uh, what, whatever, what, what, whatever people were talking about in terms of cold feet, you know, we never felt that chill. You know, no, one, no, one, no one rubbed their feet on us, I guess would be the way to say it because there was just no, uh, no indication as we were getting closer and closer to um, the, the final points of this agreement uh, that there would be any, um, uh, any impediment to accomplishing it in time for uh, the President's arrival, uh, which I think had been our common goal. Mr. Ambassador, I just wanted to move back on to electoral politics for a moment, if I could. Uh, I saw it sure. reported uh, that, that you were uh, interested in or supportive of uh, the compulsory voting model that Australia has, as opposed to the non-compulsory model that most of the world has. And, and as, I guess, an Australian political scientist, it's interesting to see someone like yourself take that view, because uh, internationally it's quite uncommon uh, for other parts of the world to support the Australian model, yet we here consider it uh, a pretty good one, generally. Uh, what is it that, that leads you to, to have a, a supportive attitude towards uh, compulsory voting as opposed to the system that exists now in the United States? Well, you know, I haven't, I haven't said that we should adopt compulsory voting, but I do think that it's worth looking at because there are some real advantages that we've seen here that would address some of the concerns that people have expressed about voting in the U.S. You know, the, 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 the main opposition that I hear to compulsory voting from, uh, from my friends in America is that you know, you can't tell people to vote. It's just not, it, it's not the American way. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, this is a voluntary choice. But in the United States, if you want it, uh, it ev everyone uh, has to appear for jury duty. And if you don't show up for jury duty, uh, you, get, you, you get fined. And it's very similar to the system that we have here in Australia for voting, which is if you don't show up and turn in a ballot, whether you fill in the ballot or not, uh, you can get a fine. And uh, so I think the, the argument in the U.S. would be, well, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, if jury duty is one of those obligations of citizenship that you're required to do in order to, to be a proper citizen, why wouldn't voting, the most essential aspect of being a member of a democracy, also have that same rule? So I, I think it's worth our looking at. In terms of the effect it has, I think the attractive aspects of getting more people to vote is it takes a lot of the money out of politics. You don't have to slice and dice the demographics. You aren't trying to target single-issue voters. You need to speak to the entire public as opposed to individual sets of voters in one county or another. Uh, and, and by doing that, I think you uh, maybe raise the, the level of debate a bit and also take some of the money out, which are two of the things that you hear as perennial complaints about our, our current uh, a campaign system, which goes on so long and is so so expensive, uh, so so for those reasons, I think there's value in at least uh, looking at and and how Australia has done this. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one last quick anecdote, which is uh, I had mentioned this to a friend back in the states, and they said, well, you know, we 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 pioneered democracy and 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 uh, and, and the electoral election process. And I said, yeah, but we've learned stuff from Australia in the past. In fact, the secret ballot used to be called the Australian ballot yeah. back in the United States because we didn't have secret ballots at first. You would just, you know, take your vote, hand it to someone, they'd read it loud, stick it in a box. And if people didn't like how you voted, they may, you know, 
uh, beat you up in the parking lot afterwards. So, yeah, um, thanks for the uh, secret ballot there, Australia. <laughs> In the last uh, couple of days, uh, the Prime Minister has said that President Obama is one of the world leaders who've raised with her her famous speech, uh, where she attacked Tony Abbott as a misogynist and as a sexist. Uh, do you know if it's uh, uh, correct that uh, President Obama congratulated the Prime Minister on that speech? Um, no, and in fact, I, I, I'm familiar with the uh, Prime Minister's comments and what she said was that she wasn't going to talk about anything they discussed and I think she was asked a question about whether or not uh, uh, he was aware of the speech and she said I think it's fair to say that he was aware of it but whether or not they discussed it or not is not a um, uh, yeah, not something that she's talked about and certainly we don't talk about their, uh, their, their conversations. And do you know what his own reaction to the speech is? Um, no I'd say I don't, I don't. Can I just ask you, Ambassador, on this issue, uh, there's been plenty of discussion about what, if any, implications from the US result might be able to be drawn here in Australia, both in terms of the demographic makeup of the way people voted uh, and some of the issues in the mix. Do you see any uh, points of comparison? Well, you know, our election system is very, very different, as we were just discussing, between uh, the United States and Australia. Uh, and also, the, uh, every election is a little bit different. You know, if you just look at the concerns that people had four years ago in 2008 uh, when we were in the midst of the global financial crisis and, uh, and deeply enmeshed in, in Iraq and, and uh, sort of on the back foot in, in Afghanistan. They're a very different set of issues this time around. So it's hard to compare uh, apples to oranges. Uh, on the other hand, I think the one thing that I, I was able to be a little bit more philosophical about watching my own election from abroad uh, is the importance of, of uh, people understanding that government matters. Government is good. In, in, uh, uh, it, it, it can be used for bad purposes, but that in the end, every great society has a strong government, has a strong business sector, strong educational and nonprofit institutions. Um, and and uh, that these are essential elements of any, of, of any stable society. And the more the political parties find that they get benefit from just putting down government, saying government can't solve problems, the more the public starts to think, well, maybe, you know, if, if, if everyone in government seems to think that it can't work, you know, why should I be trusting it? I think it's important for us to uh, protect the brand of government and, and let people see the good things that it does and, and how much has been accomplished with good governments and occasionally, you know, remind people what countries with poor governments really look like and, and or, or absent governments really look like and they're, they're not places that most of us would want to live. Well uh, talking about effective government let's just go briefly to the fiscal cliff issue. Uh, the President will now direct his attention to this. Uh, our own Treasurer Wayne Swan has said that if this issue is not resolved the consequences will be catastrophic uh, for the global economy. Uh, what's your own assessment? about the President's capacity and the capacity of the United States political system to resolve this? You know, I have, I have confidence that the uh, fiscal cliff will be averted uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, but uh, the main one is that uh, Congress created this fiscal cliff uh, precisely because they needed something that was such a terrible default that they couldn't accept it. And so they created this, this uh, sort of Damocles to hang over their head uh, as a default to force them to make some decisions that are hard decisions for them to make. Uh, so in the first place they recognize that this would have calamitous effects uh, for not only our economy and, and other economies that are uh, important to us but also uh, for our security. And so uh, I, I think that's the first reason. Second reason is that we have a historic opportunity at this point where you have a divided government. It's much easier to make this kind of a choice when you've got uh, Republican control of the House and Democrat control of uh, the White House and Democrat control with a filibuster threat in the, uh, uh, by the Republicans in the Senate. Those actually help you navigate what is very treacherous waters for both political parties. Democrats have to um, allow some reforms of entitlements that they had uh, previously objected to and Republicans are going to have to agree to revenue measures uh, that they've previously said they wouldn't do. And so both sides have to do it at the same time. And I think divided government actually creates uh, an opportunity for this president. Uh, then 
I think uh, there is just the fact that you've got a brand new president, and that creates its own uh, momentum. You know, no one's going to wait someone out for four years, and so they know this is the time to do it when you're still far away from the next election. Uh, and then finally, I think the markets really won't tolerate a long, long delay in resolving our budget issues and, and creating a sustainable path for, uh, 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 for reducing our deficit. And if you do all that, frankly, I, th I think uh, your foreign minister was right when he said, you know, we're one budget deal away from, uh, uh, from fully restoring the, the, the strength of the U.S. economy. Uh, we are, you know, spring-loaded for a very, very good recovery, but we need to get through this, uh, this impasse first. U.S. Ambassador to Australia, Jeffrey Bleich, thanks very much for joining us on the program. We're uh, certainly glad that you're going to be here for another four years. We hope we can have you back. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Paul.